introduce our first keynote speaker, and that is Dr. Ray Shinazi. Uh, Dr. Shinazi is the Francis Winship Walters Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the Laboratory of Biochemical Pharmacology at Emory University, co-director of the HIV Cure Scientific Workshop Group, the NIH-sponsored Emory University Center for AIDS Research. He's auth authored over 550 papers, uh, submitted over 22 new drug applications uh, to the FDA. He's a world leader in the development of antivirals for HIV, Hep B, Hepatitis C, including stavudine, lamivudine, emtricitabine, uh, as well as tepivudine, and finally, sofosfuvir, uh, which uh, I can tell you is the most stunning drug advance in uh, modern hepatology. Uh, he's a recipient for the, his work of many, many awards, include the William Middleton Award from the Veterans Affairs, uh, 2014 Distinguished Achievement Award from the uh, Institute of the American Liver Foundation. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, he most recently was uh, received France's highest civilian honor, the Légion d'Honneur, for saving millions of lives globally, and he's internationally recognized as one of the most influential uh, persons in the life science sector. I'll say personally, um, for those who are in this field and who uh, lived with uh, as caregivers of the suffering of patients who had chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C, diseases that affect hundreds of millions worldwide. The impact of these drugs simply cannot be overstated. I remember uh, vividly in the uh, national meetings when the first data showed that a drug combination or sofosfivir, which he was instrumental in creating, began to cure patients without using toxic drugs that had many side effects. There was literally a, a, a collective breath hold and a gasp in the audience that for anyone who was there will never forget it. So for me, it's a great personal pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Raymond Shinazi. Ray? First of all, it's a real pleasure to be here in New York again one of my favorite cities, and um, congratulations on achieving 50 years. That's quite an accomplishment. It's really a, a pleasure to be here also because my old boss, William Prusov at Yale, was a very good friend of Peter Palesi for many, many years, who's in the audience. And to me, it uh, brings back memories, great memories of uh, uh, discussions and talks we had together many years ago. And of course, Peter is well known for his amazing work on influenza, so uh, really your institution really has contributed immensely with people like Peter, and I now uh, see some of the other legends who are also uh, among you. Hopefully we'll create some new legends uh, coming up. So when I was invited, I didn't know what this meeting was all about. I saw the word Sina, I thought it was something to do with China, but I wasn't quite sure but it turned out to be a very interesting uh, program based on what I've seen so far. Very diverse uh, on innovation, which is what uh, the, the, the building blocks for innovations are done in the labs and then they're translated into industry and creating jobs and creating wealth and creating, of course, health, uh, global health, which is what's important here. I had also mentors like you did, uh, Professor Scott, uh, Friedman. Uh, this was uh, Gertrude Ilion, a woman, an amazing woman, who said, it's amazing how much you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And this is a picture of me on the right-hand side when I was a young man with a bit more hair and uh, wearing my sunglasses uh, with Gil Gertrude, who actually was one of the inventors of a cyclovir. And I think it's a very important thing because a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today weren't really accomplished by me only. It, it, takes, it takes a village to discover and develop drugs. Uh, I'm just a messenger. I'm also, sometimes I have some ideas which are good and sometimes I don't. Most of the time, my things fail. Things fail and we learn from the, study, the studies we've done. Uh, but we've been very fortunate, uh, having had tremendous mentors, including Gertrude, to come up with a number of drugs that have really changed the landscape in terms of antiviral agents. My, the godfather of antiviral was basically William Prusov, and he was the one who invented idoxyuridine, and I trained under him. And during my tenure with him, and right after I left his lab at Yale, uh, we discovered stavudine, which was one of the 
uh, main mainstay drugs for HIV at the time, and probably one of the most successful drugs at the time, although it had some uh, toxicity. But I think the major discovery happened about 1990, uh, approximately, when we discovered with Dr. Dennis Liotta at Emory University, uh, lamivudine and emtricitabine. And these are really drugs that are being the cornerstone of antiviral therapy, and they've used even now both, one of them at least is generic, uh, lamivudine is generic, and was actually the first drug not only to have activity against HIV, but also activity against hepatitis B virus. So we got uh, two birds with one stone. And I remember it was a, really a revolutionary drug when we discovered it, although at the time the NIH didn't think very highly of, uh, of a nuclear science, but it was a complete uh, change. Uh, in mindset because a lot of the nucleosides that came before lamivudine and emtricitabine were fairly toxic. Uh, these drugs are essentially not toxic and they're used by millions of people today, not only uh, on their own for hepatitis B, for example, lamivudine, but also in combination uh, in, in, to prevent uh, maternal field transmission. Today it's unheard of maternal field transmission of HIV thanks to these drugs. Uh, PrEP, you've heard about PrEP, I'm sure. Uh, these are prophylaxis of, uh, of uh, giving uh, uh, lamivudine with, uh, with tenofovir, or uh, sorry, FTC with uh, FTC, or it can, be, can also be lamivudine too, but the drug is Truvada, which is basically FTC plus uh, tenofovir DF. Uh, this is used for PrEP, and it's been a tremendous life-saving because it prevents transmission of virus, and we know that if we have low levels of virus in your circulation, in general, you're less likely to transmit the virus, and uh, you can, I'm not saying you should uh, not uh, have safe sex, but I certainly think it's important to have a bit like your car, have a seat belt as well as airbags operational when you have sex, so it's important to take these drugs, but also to have additional protection. Again, um, these drugs have stayed for a long time, even after the drug FTC, for example, was discovered, was actually approved uh, back in 2004 or five. And uh, clearly it's, had a, it's still around, it's still being used, and the patent doesn't expire until 2023, approximately 21, 22 or 23, depending on what country you're talking about. Another L nucleoside, so there's what I call the L revolution, the L nucleoside is telbivudine, which is used for hepatitis B. It's the only drug for hepatitis B that is specific for, a, for hepatitis B and doesn't work against, uh, against HIV. Sof Sofosovir, as we know today, Sovaldi is a, also a powerful drug. Not only does it uh, suppress the virus, but it also cures uh, HC HCV. So it's pr primarily the HCV drug. And it's actually the first drug that, uh, that can cure a viral disease, and I'll talk about that later, how we discovered this briefly and, and discuss uh, these some of these molecules. I don't have much time, but I want to also talk about some of the newer stuff that we're working on on hepatitis B. So the revolution really occurred back in the 90s when we discovered that L-nucleosides, which is the left-handed nucleosides, most of the DNA and RNA in your body are D-nucleosides. Actually, when they were phosphorylated, they could get, you could get uh, antiviral activity, specific antiviral activity. In fact, telvivudine is nothing more, it's not even a nucleoside analog, it's a nucleoside, it's the L form of thymidine. If you think about it for a minute, it's uh, remarkable. It's not a nucleoside. So in another world, somewhere out there, there could be a whole DNA made up of uh, L nucleosides instead of D, of, instead of, uh, D nucleosides. And this was fundamentally important because we discovered these compounds are phosphorylated, the L nucleosides are phosphorylated triphosphate, and they actually are, when they're incorporated, they have some resistance to exonucleases, so they stay a bit longer. They do get cleaved eventually, but um, it's, it's they're chain terminators, so that's, uh, that's how they operate, the chain DNA, ch or DNA chain terminators in the case of HIV and hepatitis B. This was a fundamental discovery, and it led to, I said, the multiple drugs. And today, more than 94% of HIV-infected persons take a combination containing one of these uh, nucleosides that I mentioned today. And it was actually the first oral treatment for hepatitis B, lamivudine, 
was another gift, I think, to humanity and still being used widely, even though there are better drugs today that control hepatitis B virus. Turning to HCV, and again, you know, when you think about speed, which is critical in science today, especially today, it's a lot of competition, so you have to go fast when you realize that within 25 years, approximately, of the discovery of hepatitis C virus by the Chi people at Chiron Group, combined with people at CDC. Um, the virus was there, of course, but they discovered what it was, and we didn't know, we used to call it non-A, non-B in the old days. And uh, it's a major killer globally. And we had very quickly, we, the drug was, I said the virus was discovered in 89. Within a few years, we, get, we had interferon and interferon riba, so we were making progress, but not enough. These drugs were not very effective against uh, the, the genotype 1, which is the prevalent genotype in the US and China, a lot of Asia. But it was quite effective against other viruses, but still you need long-term long treatment, and you also, oh, at least one year treatment, you had a lot of side effects, and it was injectable. And then slowly, slowly, people started developing proteins inhibitor, which was a major breakthrough, people in Canada initially. Uh, and then uh, came along uh, the very potent protease inhibitors, but they had also side effects. And then in 2014, 20, uh, 2014 we, uh, uh, we started uh, the drug, so Fosfavir emerged, as well as another drug, a protease inhibitor called Semeprevir, which really revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis C with uh, cure rates in the 80, high 80s to 90s uh, percent, independent of genotypes, although genotype 3 was less effective in general with sofosfavir. And today, we have uh, combinations of drugs that are super potent, and we can say, for most cases, it's 100% cure rate, but to be safe, because some people don't take their drug, or there's, they don't take the drug as, as they should, and sometimes the disease is not, is a bit more complicated, 96% uh, is common. So this is the drug on the left-hand side. It's a, it's a prodrug, a chiral prodrug of a nucleoside with a modification at the two prime position with a methyl group and a fluoro group. And it has a chirality at the phosphorus. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Both isomers are active. They get cleaved in the liver specifically. So that's one of the advantages. And I'll tell you what uh, some of the other advantages of these drugs. There have been a number of other compounds. As you can see the chronology, approximate chronology of the discovery of Simeprevir and Sofosfavir in 2013. The NS5A, the Glasavir, the Dipasphere, and then the work from uh, AbbVie and some of the other companies. Um, and more recently, um, we can now go down to about eight weeks treatment and get a cure. To, today, the, the other treatments is 12 weeks of treatment and you get uh, up close to 100% cure. So that's really uh, very exciting. Nucleosides really are great drugs for this particular class, although they're used for herpes viruses, you know, with drugs like acyclovir and for CMV, cytomegalovirus and others, but in general, they have high potency, no drug-drug interaction, no protein binding pangenotypic, high barrier to resistance, and low pill burden and orally bioavailable. We're very lucky with hepatitis C in the, for the, by the fact that uh, there is a mutation that can emerge with people taking sofosfavir, but fortunately, work done even before the discovery of sofosfavir by the group at Merck demonstrated that the uh, mutation, the key mutation, that occurs with sofosfavir is a debility to the virus. So it's limping, it's a virus that's limping, and not very fit, and that's one of the reasons why you can, after even the virus emerges, if it does emerge, uh, the resistant virus, you can continue treatment and get cure rates. So that's very exciting. We got lucky there, I must say. Uh, otherwise it would be like we are with HIV, having to take two or three drugs for a long period of time. You wouldn't have a cure. Now, in terms of the discovery, very quickly, I mean, it's, um, it's a lot of years of experience, but we tur it turned out that uh, we, it's all, all to do with technology and having the edge, and I, I think the dean is in the audience too, so I think it's important to have uh, good instrumentation 
uh, to be successful today in science. And having the uh, right tools uh, really do help, does help. But back in 1990, real-time PCR just emerged. And uh, without real-time PCR, I think the discoveries of all these drugs would have been a lot slower. And we made an investment in a real-time PCR machine, which allowed us to quantify uh, RNA very rapidly, and that really helped us. And because of that, plus some other factor like the discovery of the replicon system developed not far from here by Ralph, uh, Ralph uh, from uh, Charlie Rice lab, as well as Bart Schlager in Germany, uh, this really ch provided a turnaround for the discovery of agents against hepatitis C virus. Initially, from our library of nucleosides, we discovered that two prime fluoronucleosides were effective against HCV, but not very active. That's the compound on the left-hand side. See, it's at a two prime fluoro. It's a simple nucleosidatine nucleoside. And gemcitabine, I think you're very familiar with this drug as an anti cancer agent. It does have anti HCV activity, but as you know, it gets deaminated, the U analog, which is essentially inactive. And it's got some toxicity issues. And so, simultaneously, another company I founded called Identix Pharmaceutical developed this molecule, which is a two prime methyl nucleoside cytidine, very simple molecule. So we thought, how about putting a methyl and a fluoro at the two prime position? We could have had no antiviral activity whatsoever. We couldn't really predict. It's very hard to predict because these drugs work at the triphosphate light, uh, uh, at the triphosphate form and interact with the viral DNA. So you can't really always predict what's going to happen. Uh, but lo and behold, it did work. And from that, uh, we discovered this, this molecule, which we call 6130. And 6130 was a great drug, but unfortunately didn't have a great bio oral bioavailability, about 20% oral bioavailability. But through the uh, scientist at a company called Pharmacet, which I founded, we studied the cellular pharmacology and discovered the compound is rapidly phosphorylated to the monophosphate, diphosphate, and triphosphate. The triphosphate interacts with the HCV polymerase with a KI of 0 0.06 micromolar with a half-life of five hours. Luckily, this uh, Japanese scientist who actually, it's Japanese origin, I should say, American Japanese origin science of Murakami, discovered also that there was another pathway. This is the, the mono, at the monophosphate level. The drug is deaminated to the U analog and then to the uh, diphosphate and the triphosphate. And the KI was not as good as the cytosine analog, but the half-life was a lot, a lot longer. We also found in monkeys, when we gave this compound, 6130, it got also deaminated very rapidly. So that was, so we made actually the deaminated product essentially inactive in cell culture. So we thought based on this data, why don't we make the prodrug, a prodrug which would deliver the monophosphate, which delivered this molecule intracellularly. If we do that, we could have a drug that could work. And indeed, that's what we call today sulfosfavir. So this is uh, very interesting from the point of view that we have a compound that's totally inert, this molecule here. But when you have it as a monophosphate, it gets phosphorylated to triphosphate, and that's actually the active metabolite that inhibits the virus with a fairly good affinity for the polymerase and it causes chain termination. And it has a long half-life, so you can give it once a day, and that's exactly what's happened today. Uh, we give it uh, sulfosfavir once a day. Uh, drug has a fairly good half-life in humans. We were not the only one developing uh, anti-HCV drugs I mentioned earlier. There were other people working with um, uh, NS5A inhibitors and also non-nucleoside uh, NS5B inhibitors. And the idea was basically, like we do for HIV, is to combine, uh, combine this drug. And we've been able to really convert, I mean, quite remarkably convert a lot of people, seroconvert a lot of people who are, who are very sick with these molecules in combination, especially to get NS5A or a protease inhibitor with a nucleoside. And, and the idea today is to see if we can shorten treatment because today is 12 weeks and we set up a study in Hong Kong with a genotype 1, 1B patient. These are probably the, two, in the old days with interferon, they were the hardest to treat. Today, they are the simplest to treat with the current drugs that we have. And we published that in Lancet Gastroenterology two years ago, December, December of uh, 2016. 
where we got 100% uh, cure rate after three weeks of treatment. So I think really it is possible if we have the right drugs, the right triplet of drugs, uh, the Previrs, the Asvirs, or the Buvirs, with some ingenious methodology like looking at uh, response-guided therapy, we can actually get tremendous response uh, in patients and 100% cure rate. I strongly believe that's possible, maybe not three weeks, maybe four weeks for genotype 1A, which is a bit more difficult to treat for people with cirrhosis. But certainly that's one of the few things left to be done in the terms of HCV. But if you were to apply for an NIH grant today for HCV, I don't think you'll get it, uh, not anymore. Uh, hepatitis B is different, but certainly HCV, it's over. I think this is one of the few things left to be done, is shortening the treatment duration. I think it's good for many reasons. Uh, as of October of this year, about four million people have been cured with HCV worldwide. This is an approximate number. Um, more than, but there's still over 67 million people still to be cured, and let's not forget there's a new rate of infections, about 1.75 million per year, so we really have uh, uh, it's had an impact, definitely, especially for people who are severely compromised with F3, F4, uh, severity of disease, cirrhosis of the liver. But clearly, we still got a lot of work to be done in terms of identifying the people who have HCV. And I think the problem is not going to go away as rapidly as people may think. Uh, we're going to have to go beyond 2030, 30, at least, uh, although the aim, you should have to have the aims, WHO, thinks by 2030 will have cured everybody in the world. I have my doubts, but we'll see. We've had hepatitis B for vaccination for a long time, and that's not yet. We haven't completely eliminated hepatitis B globally. And there's still lots of population to treat, including people in prisons and newly infected, so that's another issue, social issue, and moral issues, and ethical issues that we have to deal with, and this is quite important. We've seen what's happened with HCV, with HIV, where you have people like the guy on the left-hand side, and then we give him drugs like emtricitabine or lamivudine, and he looks pretty healthy. I think the same thing, we, we have trouble with HCV. HCV has no shows, no visible scars like HIV that inspire the public to advocate solutions. So clearly we, we need to um, bring more awareness and testing and treating is important for HCV. We have to have access to these drugs is critical and provide years of quality life, taking people out of their deathbed, as we've been successfully done with HIV. Why not for HCV? And really, we've had an amazing story, medical story. For the first time, we cure a viral disease. We also prevent cancer with these drugs. The products are getting better and better. We, from Savaldi, the combination, the pangenotypic combo to shorter treatment, I think maybe nanoparticles, increased life expectancy, and um, I think also some of the concept developed by my colleagues in Canada, in Vancouver, uh, Julio Montana, uh, treatment as prevention like we've done for HIV is something to be done with HCV, and linking to care is, will be a powerful tool towards global elimination and eventual eradication. And uh, as somebody who, who's seen the power of medicine with my own family who suffer from HIV as well as other diseases. I really like to think that uh, I like to spend my life curing diseases rather than providing Band-Aids, which is what a lot of us do uh, in the lab. We really need to empower the young people to think about cure rather than treatment as going forward. So I would like to think that for HCV, we will one day have a CPAC like we have a ZPAC, and the ultimate goal will, will, will be disruptive, one pill, one cure, one injection, one cure for global HCV eradication and huge cost saving. I think that's possible if we put our minds together and let the companies work together rather than compete with each other. So that's something that I look forward to, hopefully in my lifetime. I have about a few one, one or two minutes left. I want to just talk about hepatitis B before I, before I uh, turn over to the panel. Um, I think you know the problem of hepatitis B globally. It's uh, 686,000 deaths worldwide per year due to 
chronic hepatitis B. There's uh, 400 million people, much bigger than HIV and HCV combined. Uh, Two-thirds of the cases are in poor and developing countries. And what's important, people say, well, we get great drugs for, H for hepatitis B. Why bother? You know, we don't need to cure. Well, guess what? Uh, even on existing therapy, infected individuals can develop liver cirrhosis, liver disease, and hepatocytic carcinoma. Less so, but still, it can happen. So that's one other reason why we need to, to find a cure for hepatitis B. It's a much bigger problem. The good news is that the half-life of one of the reservoirs for hepatitis B has been recently determined to be between 10 and 20 weeks. So theoretically, you can cure hepatitis B by eliminating cCDNA and probably integrated uh, DNA. Uh, I think it is possible. Uh, unfortunately, cCDNA, which is the latent form of the virus in cells, is not affected by nucleosides, the current drugs that are approved by the FDA. There's no partial impact by interferon, and they do get replenished from the cytoplasmic core, so you have to stop that. We do have the integrated HBV, and there's a big question of whether this is latent, completely latent, dormant, or active, but I think it's probably not that dormant. We have an impaired immune system, so we really need the immune system to work with us. Immuni immunity didn't really play a big role for hepatitis C. I, I'm hoping that immunity will have a bigger role for hepatitis B and maybe some of the immunological approaches combined with some of the newer therapies will, will have a bigger impact. And as I mentioned, existing therapies act only on a few steps in HPV replication. So why I, I'm a big fan of HPV capsid uh, protein interaction. I don't have much time to go through this, but basically the reasons are listed here. HPV capsid is essential for viral replication. HPV capsid assembly factors inhibit this replication and can diminish or suppress CCDNA. We can do it at least in culture and in some animal models, as I'll show you in a minute. So we've been working for a long time on this, and we came up on this class of compound, which we call GLP, glyoxamide, pyrolamide, pyrolimides, and uh, we found a compound that has about a three nanomolar inhibitor, so we're quite excited about this compound for various reasons. It's actually not toxic. It does reduce CCDNA amplification, it's active in human primary hepatocytes. In vivo, it has a long stability in dogs and plasma, human plasma, good stability in human liver microsomes, long half-life in animals. And it's uh, compared to some of the competitors, it's probably the most potent um, uh, capsid effector that we know with this type of uh, potency, as you can see. Very exciting. And if you take uh, capsids and uh, incubate uh, with a compound, and try to induce assembly, you can look by electron microscopy what happens. This is one of the competing compounds developed by the Chinese called GLS-4. You get misassembly and hollow spheres. You can see them here. With GLP-26, you get incomplete hollow spheres, smaller spheres for some reason. And I can blow it up. This is basically what I call broken capsid or like cracked, uh, broken, uh, cracked eggs. You can see very clearly the capsid open up and obviously releasing all the contents out into cytoplasma into the nucleus and cytoplasm. So this is uh, in one way, one, one type of compound that we have, GLS-4, GLS-6, GLS, uh, GLS-4, sorry. And then GL, GLP-26 does a different thing. It actually makes the, the, you can see by electron microscopy, there's tightly packed boiled egg. <laughs> That's what I call them very simply. And um, uh, we, think, we think this mechanism may be better, but we can debate that because we don't want to release too much DNA into, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, human being when you, when, you break, when you break this down. Now, we have done work in mice. These are tra transplants with liver transplants. They're not immune reconstituted mice, but there are. This is in collaboration with friends at the Institut Pasteur. This is a summary of some of the work we've done looking at, uh, first of all, we get a four log drop in HPV DNA. Within, a very, within, 10 days of, within 10 weeks of treatment. This actually can, happens very fast, but we also can see HPE antigen reduction in the treated group here we're doing with entecavir. Entecavir has no effect on E antigen or S antigen. I'm not showing you this data for clarity. And if we can also see that this drug can have an impact on HPS antigen. And HPS antigen is produced primarily from the integrated um, 
DNA of uh, hepatitis B. So we are having an impact on both. And we actually are able to cure, so-called cure, our mice uh, with this type of combination. So it's very, very exciting. And we are moving these compounds forward towards the clinic. And this summarizes some of the work uh, that I've just described very quickly. And I think these caps have inhibited not only ours, but many other companies like Assembly and other, uh, other companies are involved uh, in discovery of capsid effectors and also siRNA and other technologies. Uh, I think this is gonna be, I think for the capsid, this will become the backbone component of many future HPV curing regimens and we'll get some data soon, a bit like we have for NS5A inhibitors for HCV. So I'm very confident that with time, we will have um, really powerful drugs that can be used in combination like we have for HIV and even for HCV. I'm gonna finish up by saying what's important here is that elimination, I believe that elimination of HPV, but I'm eternal optimist, is possible and we need to mobilize stakeholders, academia, public health, venture capital, industry, regulatory agency and government, together we can make a difference. And as a science fiction writer said, Everything is theoretically impossible until it's done, and if you're French, you say impossible n'est pas français. Um, uh, impossible is not French. We really have the tools. We need to have the willpower to make this a priority, and I think there is a lot of interest in working with hepatitis B virus. I just came back from a conference in Taormina, Sicily, and it was fantastic. Uh, over 600 young people working on hepatitis B uh, I didn't tell them about my drug. I didn't want to disappoint them. But they're still working very, very hard and, um, on hepatitis B. And I hope, uh, I hope together we make a difference. So with that, I want to just finish with a few words of wisdom for success because a lot of people ask me, uh, how come you've been able to do all this? <laughs> and I say, uh, here are some pointers for the young people in the audience. Uh, in our business, we say, and I learned this from Gertrude Ilion, she told me that when I was a young man, know what is wrong with your drug before someone else finds out. This is uh, very important. Uh, and if you're gonna fail, fail fast. You're not a failure, it's a drug that fails. So I've had many failures, I don't talk about them. But, you know, don't forget, you do the right, the right job. You try to find something wrong with your drug, kill it. If not, keep going. If the drug fails, okay, keep going, doesn't matter. We'll find some other drugs, especially if you're innovative. Uh, I think doing nothing, doing nothing has consequences, and that's something for the young people, too. And what's really important is to believe in you, even though sometimes you don't get the funding from NIH, you just get persevere, and eventually you'll get the funding. Um, so every drug, you have to be a champion for your drug if you really believe in it. And I think today, in this day and age, we can't do everything on our own, so we need collaborations, and it's very important to choose your collaborators wisely and have great collaborators who deliver. Uh, is absolutely critical. So those are some of the things that I've followed through in my life and it's worked very well with me. I've got terrific collaborators who worked with me for many years. Uh, people in my lab, uh, people in China, in Hong Kong, in uh, Los Alamos, uh, in Paris, uh, also University of Maryland and uh, Pasteur Institute. And of course, uh, I did finally receive support. I continue to receive support from NIH, so thank you, NIH. And uh, I'll stop here, thank you very much.